Good morning, everyone. We will get started here in just a minute as people kind of trickle in. All right, it is 10.01, so let's get let's get going. We'll go kind of slow, let people get in. It's the Tuesday after daylight saving time, and it was rough in my household this morning. <laughs> um, before we, we let Armando start, um, just let everybody know you're um, on mute the whole time, but there's a, a chat feature that you can type messages to us and we'll answer questions um as we go along um and there are a few polls that armando is going to be giving you so please participate in those that makes it a little bit more interactive and at the end there's a little bit um longer survey it's still short um to let us know how we're doing um and a few days from now we'll post a recording of this presentation along with the slide deck on our website and there's our email address. You can reach out to us at any time um, if you have comments or questions. And just a reminder, because not everybody knows, the Lighting Design Lab is a part of Seattle City Light. We're Seattle City Light employees and um, have been for decades now. And the Lighting Design Lab is um, a pretty uh, cool at the intersection of end use customers, trade allies, and design allies, where everybody can get together and be on the same page about new technologies, um, code. If you guys uh, took the code series earlier, if you didn't, um, we're gonna offer it again this fall. Um, but it's a, it's a nice place where kind of everybody who's in this industry can converge and meet each other and, and learn. Uh, and besides education and training, we do technology evaluation um, and have some tools and resources, especially online now as we're, our, our cool space is closed. You can see that uh, behind these boxes. Um, and do information aggregation when we can, like um, attending uh, conferences and bringing that information back, back to you. And without Further ado, let's get started with Armando. Awesome, thank you very much, Katie, and good morning, everybody. Let me get my camera situated here. Uh, I think we're good. Uh, again, good morning, everybody. My name is Armando Berdiel. I am the Technical Development Supervisor for Lighting Design Lab. I uh, have a bit of a background in computer science, business, engineering, management. Uh, uh, and schooling. I uh, started working with network lighting controls with Lutron Electronics as a system support engineer, uh, then worked inside commercial sales, uh, then eventually moved on to a market partner that worked on retrofit jobs all over the Northeast. Uh, so good, good experience in controls and lighting and uh, have a passion for, for just these connected lighting technologies and the IoT applications that are developing and just excited to share with you all a little bit about how to communicate the network lighting controls value proposition. So that's going to be what we're going to be talking today. I expect that some of you already have knowledge on, on the lighting controls. So I'm not going to necessarily go through the 101 basics, although we may do a little recap. Uh, this handout, if you do grab it from our website, we'll have a good amount of links to different resources uh, and websites that have additional information. Um, I'll tell really bad jokes across the presentation, so please bear with them. Uh, and we'll give examples of manufacturers' products and endorsements or the opposite of endorsement if it's not seen in a good light. Uh, but they are just examples of emerging technology for the sake of discussion. So as we get started, just a couple of terms that we're gonna be using. Uh, if, you, if you hear us refer to lighting controls, advanced lighting controls, uh, network lighting controls, we're talking about network lighting controls, and we'll we'll see exactly what that means in the next slide. Uh, when we say LLLC, we're talking about level lighting controls. Uh, those are what we call the smart fixtures, and we're going to be focusing on those a little bit as well. 
Uh, when we talk about connected lighting, we talk about the intersection of LED fixtures with NLC product behind it. Uh, you know, get, getting the smart aspect of the lighting in there. When we say NEB, we talked about we talk about non-energy benefits, and those are all of the applications that network lighting controls bring us today that don't have to do with saving energy, uh, but do add a lot of value to business practices or, or whatever the goals of a building or environment may be. And when we say SBE or smart buildings, we talk about the smart building ecosystem. We have smart lighting, smart HVAC controls, uh, smart security system, fire alarm, whatever the case may be, all part of the smart building ecosystem. Uh, showing a little bit here, we have a, a control tech terms guide, and, and we have a good amount of resource guides on our website where we break these terms down in applications. And before I mention it, even this class is uh, created after one of our network control guides where we develop best practice guides. Uh, it's a series of six guides that, that uh, we put together along with Better Bricks and the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. Solid amount of information there. If you, again, go to the website in the resources tab, you'll find them. Good information to go through. Uh, what we are not going to be talking about are distributed lighting controls. Uh, what is the difference? Distributed systems, they'll, they'll allow the components of the system talk to each other. So, you know, uh, sensors will talk to a relay, will talk to a wall station, but there's not that much smarts beyond the components communicating. There's no real uh, limited to no integration or interoperability with other systems or commissioning interface. Uh, the example that we have here on the left has a remote to do the commissioning. So not even any like a phone application. Not to say that distributed controls don't have integration capabilities. They do, they're just a lot more limited than what we call a network lighting controls, where there's usually a, a brain or a processor, a gateway or a hub that, that oversees the system. And this usually may have a connection to be it a Wi-Fi capabilities or 3G or, or cellular capabilities or a router. And you'll be able to interface with it from a programming application on a computer, a tablet, a phone, and has a lot more interoperability or integration capabilities. And we're gonna focus on NLC, the right-hand side in this picture. A little bit of context, the IES, the Illuminating Engineering Society, has the magazine LDNA, the Lighting Design and Applications. And in 2020, they, they released what they called the Emerging Markets Report, uh, how they see the lighting industry growing uh, a little bit beyond you know, the next few years. And the key takeaways from, from their market report is, hey, interoperability is going to be critical. The ability for lighting systems to serve more than just light functions or talk to more systems in the smart building ecosystem is going to be key. Also, more importantly, the lighting customers are going to change. The people that the lighting industry traditionally works with are not the people that are going to be making decisions on the problems that the IoT applications may solve. So that's going to be a challenge for lighting practitioners as we go forward and understand who are the stakeholders that we want to we want to really reach. But then there's a disconnect with all the emerging technologies that are coming up with lighting today. Uh, it happens a lot with just very cost focused uh, stakeholders, decision makers, or even implementers, where you know you get into this tunnel vision competing on the lowest cost. Oh yes, we can do this project full of T-LEDs and a few sensors and cost piece. Uh, and what keeps on happening is that there's a lot of value engineering going on and, and diminishing mar margins, pressure to, to install projects faster just to cover costs. And what really gets lost in this race is, is the value delivered to the customers or the tenants in the space. Or the customer or the owners of the system, as well as the opportunities for repeat business. And, and we hear that the voices are at odds. We have, for example, specifiers, lighting designers, they'll say, Oh, yeah, I don't remember the last time I, I did not specify a network lighting control product or smart lighting in a sense. Uh, customers are getting a lot smarter and knowing they need integrated digital dashboard solutions. And, and interestingly enough, a lot of the emerging technology that uh, network lighting controls provide, all these technologies are, are being seen in new construction. But interestingly enough, these new construction projects 
often, more often than not, not work utilities for incentives to implement these projects. Those are markets that are separate. And the idea is, hey, let's all play together. Uh, and it's a little bit of a disadvantage with network lighting controls where the professors of NLC have been a little bit uh, harder to implement. You know, everyone remembers almost having to type in Morse code to program, you know, timer sensitivity, timers or sensitivities on sensors, wall sensors. And people remember having to climb up the ladder and into the ceilings to switch on the dip switches uh, on, your, on your sensors. Even when wireless controls first came up, there was a lot of connectivity issues and rendering them, you know, frustrating for, for owners and clients and tenants. And then daylight sensors that uh, operated in ways that people didn't like were always defeated, defeated by Dixie cups or, or at, been asked to be decommissioned. So today, network lighting controls are a lot smoother than they were before. They're easier to install, they're more capable, less complicated, less costly. But they're bringing a lot more features into the lighting space. You know, lighting controls are, are more resilient. They have dashboarding capabilities. Now with the inception of, of uh, tunable white and color tuning capabilities, they're being used for a lot more application than just link, but more like health, horticulture. There are cybersecurity implications that network lighting controls are now looking head on, looking to face. And utilities are looking to, to interface more with lighting controls in, in applications such as demand response. So the outlook is looking great for NLC today and in the future. Uh, what we wanna do is bridge that disconnect and ensure that we're delivering the right message to the right stakeholder. Um, so last year, 2020, the LEDs magazine released a state of the survey, uh, state of the industry survey where they asked people in a sense, hey, uh, for network lighting controls, non-energy benefits, how do you, do, do you think you'll be able to leverage these as a secondary business opportunity? And a whopping 72% responded uh, very likely or somewhat likely that like, yes, they are looking to leverage lighting controls as a secondary business opportunity because they recognize that they not only govern the lighting world, but that they have a lot more solutions beyond lighting. Uh, looking to recap what we call the 1990 rule, extremely similar to the 330, 300 rule, just not trademarked. But uh, in a building, you spend about 1% of your cost, of, of your building cost on, on your energy and resources. You think, you know, energy, water, waste, HVAC, uh, use of resources that include, yeah, the lighting, heating, cooling, plug loads, et cetera. 9% of your building's budget is going to be going to your space and your layout. That is, you know, how efficient is the use of your space? Uh, you know, how do you offer an optimum environment for your individual tasks, your employee interaction, your, your office overheads? And 90% of building costs can be attributed to employee wellness and productivity, the HR part of, of, a, of a building. Uh, including you know, your thermal, indoor air quality, your amenities in the space, any measures that really help Im improve the employee's health, comfort, and work-life balance as they are more productive in their space. Uh, and you can get another 100% worth of revenue and opportunities for unexpected benefits of the highly interconnected building systems that their devices and sensors can deliver very granular device level data that can be aggregated into incredibly valuable real-time business operation data. And that's what we really want to focus on. What is the power that can be harnessed with network lighting controls and other smart building systems? However, fair warning, we do not want to just uh, shout all the new emerging technologies, all the solutions, and all of the potential IoT applications into decision makers' face. You don't want to be a solution looking for a problem because a lot of that will get lost. Labels honestly have to be referred. Uh, you really need to be a listener and understand from different stakeholder communications, what are the real, be it business, be it healthcare, be it education, what are the real problems 
that this built environment is looking to solve or improve or enhance. And that is when you then understand what solutions will apply to a certain stakeholder. And yes, not decision makers, but it's about the stakeholders. There are multiple parties that are gonna be involved in the decision for implementing different lighting control applications. And, and some don't even make it to decision-making ranks. They're gonna be highly influential uh, when it comes to recommending or influencing a, a decision. Such as these are our tenants uh, that live with the system, facility professionals, building operators that leverage systems, uh, implementers, trade allies that obviously implement the system, and different owner groups that invest in the system in order for, for improving their space. Uh, so today, we're gonna be talking about moving the conversation beyond the decision makers, understanding these stakeholder types and what are their needs. Being able to articulate how network lighting control technology impacts these stakeholders. What are those applications? And leveraging existing resources to further simplify the message that you want to drive home about the value of NLCs. Uh, before we go on, are there any questions? Uh, and I see a uh, is this presentation going to be available? That is a yes. Uh, shortly after today, it will be available on our website on our resources tab. So let's talk a little bit about stakeholders. Again, from Lighting Design and Applications magazine, they had an article about, hey, are you my customer? This article was about a, a, health, a healthcare building considering non-energy benefits. And, and the key takeaway is like, hey, what are the stakeholders these stakeholders have very little to do with the lighting industry and lighting practitioners rarely talk to these stakeholders that are highly interested in non-energy benefits. They talked about, hey, asset tracking for wheelchairs. They talked about uh, wayfinding applications to have patients uh, navigate in the hospital. They talked about having temperatures logged multiple times a day. And the stakeholders were like, hey, the director of compliance, the vice president of patient care, and customer satisfaction, inventory managers, people that traditionally don't interface very much with lighting designers or contractors that are gonna be implementing lighting projects. So the idea is to reach all of these people. Uh, among the different stakeholders, you'll have recommenders, influencers, and gatekeepers, people that will not want to move forward with emerging technology, IT complications, things along those lines but it is very important to engage people that are gonna be involved or that the technology will touch because ultimately what we wanna do with the space is enhance the quality of life of the people in it. So those uh, parties that are going to be touched in some way, shape or form by the system should have a, at very least a conversation and ideally buy-in so they can recommend it to the proper uh, decision makers. I'll give you a little bit of an example. In 2017, I was working a pilot at New York University where they wanted to implement smart lighting. And we had two potential choices. We could go with the smart lamps from Lunera or we could use uh, retrofit kits from, from Philips, now, now Signify. Uh, Lunera was actually providing all of their smart lamps for free while we had to purchase the, the Evo kit, retrofit kits from, from Signify. Uh, so, we were all almost set and done uh, getting ready to implement the Lumera, Lumera smart lamps into this, this pilot project at NYU uh, until we heard that each T8 lamp was gonna need an IP address on the client's network. And as soon as late in the game, we communicated this to the IT department, they unfortunately had to shut the pilot down and say, hey, we cannot provide an IP address to each lamp. It's gonna be a lot and very quick, especially beyond the pilot stage. So we ended up going with the retrofit kits that had more so wireless uh, technology uh, and did not require an IP address per lamp or per fixture. So think on those lines, you know, understanding what are the stakeholders that can recommend or gatekeep projects and get their buy-in early is very, important. So going a little bit through our stakeholders uh, and our stakeholder archetypes, we're going to define a little bit the tenants that lives, they live with the system. 
they're always looking for easier, simple ways to interface with the building, uh, be it through wall station sensors, you know, not having the lights turn off on them, so on and so forth. They uh, would want to increase their comfort and pro productivity in their space. They want to increase the lighting quality and the, the space appears, you know, more pleasant for them. And they want a more personal, flexible way to control the environment they are in. Your facility professionals, they leverage the network lighting control systems. Uh, they also want an easy way to interface with the building. Uh, they are focusing on reducing maintenance and costs, you know, ideally with dashboarding tablet-based applications, uh, monitor and control the system. They are focused also on extending the life of the system, both fixtures and network lighting controls. Um, and ultimately they want to have seamless integration of other building systems, uh, not just the lighting. The less system, the less system infrastructure they have to work with, the better, the more simple for the facility professionals. Uh, when you have implementers or contractors, installers, people that want to implement the system, they want to simplify this installation and the maintenance process. They want to have systems that allow for flexible designs. Uh, they want to have a continuing relationship through consistent optimization of the system with the clients and the owners. And ultimately, they know that NLCs can serve a platform for additional value added benefits. And I talk about what that means in a little bit. Uh, lastly, we have the owners or owner types, user groups. They invest in the system. They want to understand that the systems that, that are implemented are, are flexible for future space changes. They want to make sure you meet code, get your certificate of, of uh, occupancy, uh, ensure that all requirements within the regulations are met. They want to reduce their operating costs and increase revenue opportunities. And ultimately, they want to future-proof uh, their buildings and, and NLCs are a great way to future-proof any application. And we'll show this more in depth in a little bit as well. So how do you map out your stakeholder types? Uh, the idea is to continue having these conversations. You ask the different stakeholders, what are your pain points? What do you want to improve in your system? You know, what, how can this affect your metrics or processes? And the idea is to continue asking what their processes are, how they function in their own building space, uh, and exhaust the list of questions where ultimately you'll be able to create the stakeholder maps with their needs, their wants, what's important to each stakeholder group. And from there, you can then develop a network lighting control solution that is going to fit their needs, not forcing the horse to drink water, but rather, you know, from the horse with the best bottle of water that you can. <laughs> uh, ultimately, you also want to tie in with their purposes and goals, be those, be it that, uh, you know, you want to have the best customer satisfaction, whether a building wants to reduce their carbon emissions, whether you want to get your certificate of occupancy, uh, or if you want to drive foot traffic and increase sales, you want to understand what those goals of, are and implementers want to foster those relationships through education, awareness of solutions, and continuous improvement. So a little recap on the stakeholders that we want to keep in mind before I keep going. Uh, any any questions so far? Question free. All right, I like it. Thanks a lot, Katie. Uh, and before we go on, I'm going to have a poll. See if you guys can can help me out here and select all that you agree with. And it is more relevant to our stakeholder types. Select these statements that you might agree with. If you guys can help me out, please. All right, I see very few answers being voted on. Oh, there we go. Oh, wow, these are getting very, very even here. I'm gonna keep it up open for three more seconds. All right, thank you for voting, everybody. Let me share this with you. 
And right, I appreciate, hey, implementers care about only making the sale. It's not selected. I like that. I appreciate the people in the space. 50% uh, on tenants are key part of the decision making that is very important, such as facility professionals. Uh, I appreciate your answers and I'll help guide how you go forward here today. So let me hide this. So it's not necessarily all about the savings, but let's review a little bit about the savings itself and some of the control strategies that Network Lighting Control will help implement. So where do save savings come from? Not, not babies, not birds and the bees, but where do energy savings come from? Uh, so ideally, we measure energy in our space with power and time. And we measure power in wattage, and we measure our uh, time in hours. So what really does happen is, you know, how much power are you using over time? When you convert a legacy source such as fluorescence and metal halides or incandescence into LEDs, you are uh, directly reducing the power that you use, saving that energy. When you add network lighting controls and luminaire level lighting control systems you reduce both uh, the power and time that that power is on. Uh, for example, there are strategies that reduce the maximum wattage that, a, that a fixture will have, again, reducing power, and through sensors, uh, you reduce the amount of time that the lights are on. So adding both systems save energy on both ends. And then when you interact with smart building systems such as HVAC controls, you can further reduce energy and by, by saving the amount of time that, that these systems are turned on. So I want to review four key network lighting control studies uh, with, with a high end trim or task tuning. Uh, that is the ability to, to cap a ceiling on the maximum brightness of a luminaire's output. That's why you see the, the gray over the over the yellow here uh, under task tuning is the ceiling on the maximum output and that it cannot be updated or changed without the commissioning tool be it a remote be it a, a phone a computer and this is done because fixture lumen packages are specified conservatively and with good reason uh, like fixtures are usually made brighter for the space it's supposed to be because designers or specifiers will not know if the color of the walls or ceilings are going to change, they don't know if there's going to be obstructions, and they mean the fixtures just may need to be brighter than than originally thought to meet the recommended foot candle uh, practice by the IES in order, and those foot candles are going to be key for for occupant comfort, reducing glare, ensuring that the tasks are done successfully. So that is why when fixtures are specified brighter than they should be, you can use this high-end trim or task tuning to just put a cap in that brightness and just ensure that the task uh, plane receives the correct foot candles that are needed. Uh, with occupancy and vacancy, and in occupancy, when one sensor in a group or in an area detects a person, that's when the lights in that space are gonna turn on. However, they will not turn off until uh, all sensors in that area or group don't see anyone specified amount of time. The difference with vacancy, however, is that lights will not turn on automatically. You need to turn them on via, you know, wall station, button press, or a timer, but they'll still turn off lights after no one is detected in a space or an area. Uh, daylight harvesting. You, you'll know that, hey, if you have a specific recommended foot handle goal for a task lane, and daylight or your natural light gets you 80% of the way there, then you only need to turn on your electric lights for about 20% uh, to reach your recommended foot candles. That's the power of harvesting daylight. That's why you have a curve uh, from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. there because more daylight available is usually in the middle of the day. And lastly, scheduling is the ability to affect the light levels at a specific, a specific time of the day or depending on sunset or sunrise. It's called astronomic scheduling. When you pair these strategies together, you have a lot of energy savings, both reducing power and the time that the lights are on. And 
obviously there's a lot more control strategies out there. You can give occupants personal control and people will usually like a space dimmer than, than their surroundings to be more comfortable. Uh, demand response, we'll talk about it in a little bit later. Uh, a utilities way to, to let a building know, hey, stop uh, using this much energy during this time because we don't have enough capacity to go on in this manner. But there's a lot more strategies such as plug load control, circadian controls, you can integrate with shades, integrate with HVAC, a lot of exciting stuff coming on, so let's let's keep it going. And very important to our message, uh, luminaire level lighting controls. These are a subset of network lighting control strategies where they're defined by four specific characteristics. Uh, they are individually addressable. These are the smart fixtures where each fixture could be a zone, although these are usually grouped in different groups. They have integrated occupancy and daylight sensors, which we just talked about occupancy and daylight. Uh, they'll allow for continuous dimming from zero to 100%. And they are networkable, not necessarily that they have an IP address, that just means they can be reconfigured easily and communicate with any type of interface, be it a commissioning tool on a phone, tablet, computer. Uh, they are great for future-proofing a space in the sense that uh, you know, they can make it's a labor cost or work. Buildings change their spaces very often, and and when they do, luminaire level lighting controls do not need to rewire to change any zones or groups. All it takes is taking out your configuration tool and being able to reprogram what those groups are. Uh, add bonus: these luminaire level lighting controls automatically meet code. A good way that we like to refer to these are, are the one-to-many and one-to-one -one, uh, motifs where, for example, if you don't have luminaire level lighting controls in a space, that means you'll typically have an occupancy sensor, a daylight sensor for many fixtures that are going to be controlled. Uh, and if you have luminaire level lighting controls, you will have one daylight sensor, one occupancy sensor per one fixture. So it's a good way to remember those for us. So when we say that LLLC automatically meets code, what exactly do we mean? Well, now with the 2018 Seattle and Washington Energy Code, there is a requirement for open offices 500 square feet or greater to have luminaire level lighting control written in the code. Or if you cannot have LLLC to meet that code, you will need to have network lighting control system with individual addressability. Uh, so almost LLLC application. And also for your space, it, it, in the code it's really written, you would want to have luminaire level control, controls for all the areas or you know, implement network lighting controls following all the code requirements that include daylight commissioning, where you need to have you know, your primary daylight row, your secondary daylight row. These all need to be wired and responding to different sensors. That can be very laborious and inefficient. Uh, with luminaire level lighting control, each fissure having a daylight sensor, uh, you don't necessarily need to, to worry about this primary, secondary daylight zone wiring. It's all done commissioned through a phone app. So, Walk through a little bit of a luminaire level lighting control application here at an open office. Consider when the office opens at 7 a.m., people are gonna initially be walking in to not the lights turned off, but <coughs> through a schedule, you can have these lights turn on what they call a background level. Have these lights turn on to 20%, just to allow for safety, ensure that people that are walking in are comfortable. They don't walk into a very bright space that kind of like glares at them and, and, and blinds them. But as people keep coming into the space uh, and sitting on their desk, the lights are going to be a lot brighter just to show that everyone has a visibility to their task. But other spaces where people have not come in yet will still be at that background level. Again, just keeping the comfort for the occupants in their space already. As people leave, the opposite thing happens. Uh, the spaces that are being vacated will go back down to that uh, background level and people that are still working because they're just good noodles are gonna have you know, the space better to them. And only after everyone is gone then can the space turn off. 
a lot of what happens these days with luminaire level light controls is lights turn on when they detect occupancy lights turn on to what is called to the daylight level so when occupant when the fixture detects that occupancy uh, it'll not turn on to 100%. It'll turn on to that recommended foot handle that the task plane requires. Uh, and it will not be 100%. It'll just be what that daylight level needs. Uh, the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance recently released a, a study, a comparison study, where they had a 1,000 square foot room. And they had nine uh, fixtures that were two lamp, 32 watt fluorescence that on one by four fixtures. So what they did here is they replaced these nine fixtures with four luminaire level lighting control systems and one network lighting control redesigned system. And they want to compare cost and savings. So when they look cost for installation, uh, you see that on the right hand side in this column, there are four luminaire level lighting control systems and all their costs are, are rather low, where they, you know, around six to seven dollars a square foot. And you see the NLC system added a good amount of cost even uh, ahead of times. Bear with me. I'm going to use my spotlight here. There we go. So even the hardware, because you need to have those ancillary sensors that are not part of the fixtures because you need to have a front end, uh, maybe a gateway, maybe a computer. Those hardware costs are a lot more expensive than simply buying uh, fixtures. And you can get these fixtures from distribution most uh, more often than not. For network that control the systems, you may need to go through a wrap that will need to design the system for you. Uh, Interestingly enough, the labor was also higher for the NLC system versus the LLC ones. And just because, again, they had to include a rep to design the space, you know, that adds to the cost. Uh, when it came down to installation time, uh, the lunar level lighting control systems were all lower in time because all people had to do was replace fixtures on a one-to-one -one basis. The NLC system probably required additional wiring uh, and additional time adding all those other components, you know, your occupancy the sensors, daylight sensors, so on and so forth. And when it came down to the savings, you know, the network lighting control system had the most savings for high end trim. But when it came to daylight and occupancy, it's the lowest tier of savings because there's more sensors in each of these fixtures. It's more granular and they can drive further savings. And when we talked about all the control measures, uh, the redesign system did not really save that much more energy than the other luminaire level lighting control systems. So they were rather comparable in savings. It, the NLC system just had a lot higher costs. Very important part of this conversation is, is the human factor. Uh, not going to go through all the surveying and, and data analysis that they did, but hey, a quick snapshot of, of the people that were surveyed in the space to, to measure lighting quality. But some of the results were, hey, the highest satisfaction was that luminaire level lighting control systems being tuned to the recommended foot candles in the space was the preferred brightness of the preferred uh, lighting. Uh, brightness was, expect was found to be lower than expected but it helped calm and keep focused than the fluorescent system. Uh, a key finding as well as though there was no real satisfact, uh, no difference between luminaire level lighting controls and network lighting controls in terms of lighting satisfaction. Having said all this about luminaire level lighting controls, I wanted to ask you guys, what is your experience with them? So I'm gonna have another poll here. What is your experience with luminaire level lighting control technologies? So regardless of where you sit in the lighting industry or if you've never really heard of them before, if you can help me answer these questions, that would be great. So thank you guys for those that started voting at this point. I see some votes still coming in. Thank you for those.
keep it on three more seconds. And I appreciate the candor of most people here. Let me share the results. I uh, like that the majority is a good solution to have and mix with other applications. Uh, and then a couple of people will say, hey, not sold on it. We'll avoid them completely. Hopefully, if, if you have questions about it, we can change your mind. We believe they're a great application, but, let, but they are not to be the panacea or the solution for every space. They're a great solution for the right applications for most other spaces and a good zone-based network lighting control application will suffice. Uh, looking to see if we have any any questions before I go into non-energy benefits, and I see that there are none, so we're going to march forward. Uh, I like the show Mad Men. Uh, this quote from Don Draper: "Hey, boy, all love invented by guys like me to sell nylons." Uh, so these are our non-energy benefits. Again, not to be the solution looking for a problem, but again great solutions are coming to light that network lighting controls can bring forward. Uh, a big concept that is going to be allowing network lighting controls to play in every space is interoperability. And what is it? It is the ability of systems or components to transmit, receive, interpret, and or react to data and or power and function in a specific way. Uh, there's a, a three main types for interoper interoperability, and these are device to device, such as a uh, network lighting control, occupancy sensor, uh, sending information to a furniture mounted temperature sensor uh, to say, hey, temperature, close the set points, open the set points. Uh, device to a system, such as a network lighting control components to the sensor itself talking to a different network lighting control system. So say my front of house occupancy sensor telling the back of house's network lighting control system to operate a certain way. Or system to system, such as NLC to an HVAC system, NLC with the building management system, security, so on and so forth. Uh, interability, Interoperability is also important when it comes to the different building systems that facility managers need to operate. There can be many types of systems in the building. And for the examples that we see here, you know, we have a, a separate system that does space utilization, a separate system that does asset tracking, a separate one for energy metering, a separate one for wayfinding. Uh, that's a lot of installed infrastructure that occurs in a building. There's also a lot of different factory calls that a facility manager may need to make for any type of maintenance, operation assistance, help. Uh, lighting can do a lot of these things themselves. And what's best, the way that lighting implements these systems, what we call flip on the switch. You can install lighting hardware and then keep adding functionality by just turning on software licenses or software packages. Uh, at the time that is needed. This this helps everybody across the stakeholder board. For example, yeah, I've been talking about facility professionals where you know you can reduce the amount of uh, factory relationships that they need to have and, and ease the learning curves that to building systems. The less infrastructure, the better. Uh, owners, again, worried about over-investing in infrastructure. You don't need to have space utilization cameras, asset tracking sensors, energy metering sensors. That's a lot of infrastructure to invest in. Implementers can, can again, uh, really follow that subject matter expertise relationships. They know how to offer, you know, that opportunity to flip on the switch to a new feature when a building has that specific need. And tenants will just enjoy uh, their built environment, improving their quality of I uh, wanted to walk through an example of network lighting control interfacing with an HVAC system. In the example that we have here, we have a, a daylight sensor, call it an LLLC sensor, that is talking to a, a touchpad HVAC controller. What the sensor communicates is, hey, are people here? Should we turn lights on and off? You know, and and 
the sensor can also tell lights, hey, there's people here, turn lights on or off, depending on the application and integration possibilities. It can, it can tell uh, operable shades and blinds to open or close. Again, opening, opening blinds to allow more heat to come in as well as daylight. And all that can feed into how an HVAC is going to operate. If there's people in the space, close the set points. Uh, maybe you can open the windows and allowing a bit more heat in and the HVAC doesn't need to work as hard. But uh, again, integrating all that is, is great for not only saving energy, but improving the quality of life of the tenants and, and occupant comfort. Uh, you can interface NLCs and HVAC not just by, by uh, an API or talking to your building management systems. It can be a simpler inter integration through a contact closure uh, relay that, that, that two systems can share from the sensor into the controller. <laughs> Um, obviously, if you can have both systems feed into a building management system, the, gra the data gets a lot more granular. And, and some building management systems are now employing these uh, artificial intelligence algorithms to learn how occupants prefer their space and also help save energy. Uh, moving on to talk about energy monitoring, control, and diagnostics. Uh, people like dashboards. Network lighting control systems can report their own energy to even utility programs, supporting those efficiency incentives without the need to install uh, or monitor efficient, uh, expensive data loggers. Uh, there are standards being worked on today as to how systems can use their energy monitoring. The Design Lights Consortium DLC is a qualifying body that's looking at these systems and telling these systems, hey, you're going to need to measure and report on data this way to be helpful, not just for your own purposes, for if you ever wanted to integrate or to send this data to utilities and, and, and work as part of these incentive programs, you're gonna need to play in this specific manner. Uh, diagnostics for systems are great for facility professionals, uh, especially because you know you, they don't have to find a needle in a haystack anymore if a fixture or a component is not communicating. Uh, these network lighting control systems can pinpoint exactly the location and what component is not communicating uh, so as to reduce maintenance costs, people finding again the needle in a haystack of what went wrong. Owners in the space with this data can report on their corporate citizenship goals. They have your green or lean building certifications uh, showing the different ways that they are saving energy. And these reports are all exportable into common data formats like CSV, cloud-based, and APIs that can feed into other systems that can maybe react to this data. Uh, two main ways that uh, energy is being done today is calculated. That is, you know, inputting the wattage of the lamp and the system will have an internal matrix where if you reduce the light by X amount of percent, this is the calculated savings of the data. Although the more and profit and where the standard heading are actual measurements of current drawns where some of the load controllers have uh, additional wires just to measure the current depending on the voltage and report on the energy that way. And that is a more popular way to, to, to monitor energy these days. Uh, also, implementers they can develop these relationships with utilities and and start having those good conversations on hey we want to tap into your your performance or your incentives uh performance savings and, and incentives we want to work with you uh by providing energy monitoring data that's going to be measured and and again that relationship will, will open more investment from utilities enabling these technologies to be invented at a faster rate uh, I want to talk a little bit about a use case with Target and Acuity Brands leveraging a smart platform called Atrius. Uh, two non-energy benefit applications, one is indoor positioning and wayfinding, were implemented uh, a great amount of Target stores across the nation, where what is happening is an interesting story, slightly scary, but a good application nonetheless. These stores are leveraging luminar level lighting control fixtures to do two main things. One is tell people where they are in the store and 
being able to navigate them to where they need to go. Uh, how, does, how does that work? So if you have your target app on your phone, you can do one of two things. You can say, hey, uh, target store, here's a mapping list of things. What the application then does, leveraging the fixtures, because they, they'll pinpoint where the user is from their phone, it'll, it'll be such a, a GPS to tell the people where to go to buy the 10 items on their shopping list. Hey, you're, the fruit stand's over there, the, the electronics are over here, uh, juice is over there, and it'll take you like a GPS on the store so you can have an efficient store experience and not have to navigate the entire store to find what you're looking for. Uh, the other way it works is if you don't have a list, but you're just walking around, let's say the fruit stand, the app will automatically know where you are and pop up, hey, here's the savings that we have on bananas and apples today. Or, hey, did, if you're walking by the electronics section, the app will, will know that and it'll say, hey, do you know we have 15% off these TVs? Uh, so again, a solid application for store. Uh, interestingly, scary for, for, for some people. But uh, I do believe it's going to be a great and, and, and develop a great shopping experience of the future. And when we talked about uh, stakeholders and owners, you know, the real key to, for these big box retailers is to drive foot traffic, drive sales, and lighting systems are being leveraged to do this today. Uh, tenants will appreciate the fact that, the, hey, I can, I can either more savings or more efficiently traverse the store. Um, moving forward, spatialization. What is the cost of empty space in a building? You know, if your building is not designed efficiently, you know, you'll have <laughs> your brainstorming rooms empty, your meeting rooms, your conference rooms empty, and this is not what you want in, a, let's say, in an office space. What you really want to do, and, and also how expensive is analyzing your space? Cost can, can range from $2 to $5 square foot for architectural firm to analyze how your space is being used. And then before you can install your an entire uh, space utilization infrastructure, you can have the cameras or sensors in the system. But why do this when it's going to be very expensive where a lighting system can be leveraged uh, for this for this reason, not installing additional hardware. All you need to do is flip up the switch, allow this this application to be to be used. Uh, the way that lighting control systems are, are are working on space utilization, you can do a couple of reporting. You can you can see hey from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. How often are my different spaces occupied? How often are private offices or open offices? How often are, are the, the conference rooms occupied between working hours? And that is great and useful information for building owners to understand how their buildings are being used. Uh, some systems even leverage heat maps where the more popular spaces end up being the restrooms. That it's, it's great to note. But as you can see in this heat map, sure, uh, private offices and workstations are very full. But these conference rooms over here are, are, are rather very ill-time used. And, and then that drives building owners to think, do we need to keep you know, these, these conference rooms there? They're barely used. Do we want to change them into something else that would be used more often and be a more efficient space? So those are the questions that light controls can help answer without having to install that additional uh, infrastructure. We talked a little bit about man response in the past. And it's where a utility will tell a building, like, hey, uh, run around your, your spaces and turn off load. It's too much load is being used across our territory. We need to save some, lo uh, some, some load and your facility technicians will then, you know, lower the energy being used, uh, turning the set points a little looser. So the HVAC uses less energy, turning off lights in areas that are not not that key. So what network lighting controls can do on a demand response application is a lot of two-way communication. So that building uh, that has a lot of energy being used can just tell a system, hey, reduce all your loads by 30% 
and the system can tell the demand response application, uh, hey, this is done. We are saving 30% energy across the board from our dimmed list. Uh, and there's a lot more that goes into demand response, but again, network lighting controls can, can help reduce the lighting, and it can also even talk to HVAC or other systems to, to help reduce that load as well. The way it could look like here are some screenshots from different systems. Uh, like, hey, you know, we want to just activate the load shed, have everything dimmed down by 34%, activate it. Uh, you can have, for example, the system from, from Route Lake Cloud, they'll send an email and you can activate demand response through an email as well. If you don't have a, a, a phone or tablet based application, you can have a demand response signal. You send a contact closure to load controllers and, and, and the system can then respond by turning off or dimming down load in itself. We'll talk about asset tracking. Uh, asset tracking is the ability for, for systems to leverage the sensors or lumen level light control sensors in their space to track important assets that will have ideally RFID tags. Uh, we'll talk about a case study with the Pittsburgh Healthcare uh, Network where they had an issue with wheelchairs. What was happening is they were losing 25% of their wheelchairs a year. They measured that they spend about a million dollars of wages lost looking for wheelchairs. Uh, and they knew that they spent $70,000 on wheelchairs every year for 200 wheelchairs. Uh, what the Pittsburgh Healthcare Network did was leverage uh, a smart platform from, from Osram called Einstone that helped track wheelchairs in real time. And what ended up happening was, you know, people knew where the wheelchairs were, were so you didn't have to find a needle in a haystack in a hospital to find a wheelchair. And, and they were not getting lost. If they were being taken outside, uh, it would flag, hey, wheelchair is outside. We are gonna need to bring this back in. And they were able to, to again, reduce a lot of time and money uh, wasted on finding wheelchairs every year. Another non benefit of network lighting controls are, is room scheduling. Uh, this is an, uh, a touchscreen from Crestron Electronics where room scheduling can do a few things. It, you can integrate into a, be it your business app or tablets across the space where, hey, you're looking to, to schedule a meeting. You can see which rooms are occupied, which, which rooms are not occupied, and then you can, you can schedule a meeting. And when that meeting is scheduled, let's say there's people already in that room Ending is in like five minutes. Well, with one minute left, the lights in the room can slowly dim up and down, letting the people know, hey, it's about to be time up for your meeting, and the next group is going to be coming in to the meeting. You can pair room scheduling with wayfinding. And again, uh, if you have a large campus, a large office campus, uh, and it's sometimes difficult to navigate, you can have you know, the lumen level lighting control, your network lighting control system, see where you are in a building and like a GPS take you where you need to go. And when you get there, it can start setting the temperature set points to be more comfortable. It can put the light levels to any specific level that you want. Uh, it's great for introverts then to, to, to have the lights flash and tell the people in the room, hey, it's time to, it's time to end your meeting. And again, yeah, implementers making these relationships that can, uh, allow these technologies to flip the on switch are great. And again, no additional infrastructure needed, just leveraging network lighting control sensors. Uh, a nice application that, that lighting is, is uh, developing these days is called Li-Fi. It is the, it's just like Wi-Fi, the ability to transmit data through radio frequency. But instead of radio frequency, you can transmit the same amount of data through the visible light or ultraviolet or infrared. Ideally, the light that's coming from your fixtures. Uh, why would you want that? A big proponent of this technology is the US military, where they can be in very secure spaces. They don't have uh, 
Wi-Fi routers because they're hackable. Uh, with Li-Fi, the only way you can interface with the network is if you are under a beam of light. So if you're not physically under a beam of light, you will not be able to access the, the internet. <laughs> uh, a system that is coming up with this app is true life and signify they are they are leveraging again their, their light to provide internet and they are looking to deploy this you know offices co-working spaces coffee houses where instead of what's the wi-fi password the the, the question would be hey can you give me the dongle to plug into your li-fi it's a bit more secure and can be a lot faster in, in communications and data Taking a second, I know I've been going through a lot of non-energy benefits, a lot of different applications and examples. Let to see if there was a, any type of a question or, 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 or any comments. I see there are not. So let's carry on. Uh, tunable white lighting. Uh, colleague Sean Dara, calls out tunable white lighting and, and, and lighting as the feature that, that is comparable to spreadsheets being on computers. By now, everyone should be aware of, of the discussions of what tunable white lighting is, how they affect your, your circadian rhythm, circadian trainings, and how it can help your, your sleep cycle. While research is, is still ongoing on this technology, uh, Again, because as lighting practitioners, we first want to do no harm and recommend, hey, this is good for you. So, but research is going, although obviously it's looking great for people experiencing changes in tunable white. Um, it at least prepares for any eventuality in this research outcome because now lighting controls are flexible. And if we want to implement tunable lighting in this space, it can be a very customized application with the lighting controls. There is a study that the Pacific Northwest National Laboratories and the Department of Energy made uh, in an education K through 12 setting where they wanted to measure, you know, how were students feeling, how were their energies in uh, three classrooms. What they did, they had, you know, hey, the master switch that controlled tunable white. They had, you know, truffers that had tunable white technology. Um, and they ran this test for some time. What they found was a couple of great things that uh, dimming was the primary benefit to move students from one activity to another. So from you know recess to, to reading or from, from lunch to a presentation, not necessarily simple white, but dimming was a great feature to change students from one activity to the next. But the tunability, the color, the, the blues and, and the yellows were a secondary great benefit for, for students to, to understand different activities were happening. Uh, I didn't mention, but uh, the warmer tones, the lower uh, CCT, you know, 2700 CCT, the warmer tones are more often uh, related to, to, relevant to serving and sleep. Uh, and the white or cooler blue tones, your 6,500, 100 T's are related to your energizing or focusing activities. Uh, so again, in this study, good amount of energy savings from the, the original fluorescent lighting that they had because they had no way to do the light. They just had, you know, 100 or 50 percent. Uh, so so just dimming, say, the good amount of energy um, and improve the working conditions, not just for the student, but from the teachers. They also benefited from having the, the circadian rhythm change with the different colors of tunable white lighting in itself. Network lighting controls are also being uh, leveraged for horticultural spaces, where if you want to consider who are the tenants of these spaces, you can consider the plants being grown as, as the tenants. Uh, horticultural spaces need a lot of information, not just in lighting, but in temperature. And in lighting itself, you need to understand when plants need 
what specific uh, spectral power distribution from the visible light spectrum do they need more blue, green, red, or what they call far red. Network light controls, again, just being able to program all this in a timer with some smarts behind it are key application to start automating these, these uh, spectrum changes for, for the different plants. Couple that with the ability to to tie into an HVAC system, change temperature and humidity for plants even better. And how implementers really shine in these applications is because a lot of the research being done on, on horticultural growth, and especially when we talk about uh, cannabis, is being done by people on YouTube that are not experts. They're just people that, you know, they watch projects, took it upon themselves to, to learn a little bit and, and, and then share the information, but it's not, again, subject matter experts. So that's why implementers that are, are in the horticultural space with network lighting controls have a key use or are in a key position to influence how a space can be lighted or heated. When we talk about exterior, uh, when we talk about network lighting controls, we can start thinking about smart cities. Uh, I want to talk about exterior lighting as like a pole, as a platform. You can add many different kinds of sensors to uh, a smart city lighting pole. You know, and 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 interestingly enough, who is the real customer when, or the real owner when it comes to this? Is it uh, the traffic management, waste management owners? Is it you know the lighting? Who really can own the smart lighting technology for exterior lighting? So when we talk about stakeholders, it's important to note a lot of people in the city will be stakeholders. A lot of people that work with the city will be stakeholders. So again, that, that just grows in, in complexity. So a lighting practitioner's ability to navigate these conversations will be crucial. We want to talk about it that we're looking at where in buildings, we're talking about connected lighting with IoT applications. Uh, and the lighting system will go across many spaces in the building, the office, offices, conference spaces, uh, lobbies, corridors. And this is all being seen as your lighting control in a building and it can interoperate with other building systems. That's, that's great then I see an even larger growth and a larger amount of data aggregation as the smart building becomes, you know, instead of the internet of things, you become the internet of buildings and a building becomes one point in the connected grid of power. Uh, this is an image from the Open AR Alliance, which is a, a protocol that allows different communications from energy prov uh, providers and energy users. Uh, it shares uh, energy use as well as time of day pricing with all of these. And as buildings become based in a larger grid, uh, again, smart network lighting control applications are gonna become more important. We can see this trend as more different network lighting control manufacturers are becoming part of this open ADR protocol alliance. You're getting ready to, to be able to be that point of communication from, from building to building. Another trend that I'm seeing is what I wanna call the smart race. Here we have uh, different manufacturers systems. They all have our smart platform and they're all sharing a good amount of features. And ultimately, there's a lot of unique features the system are looking at, but they are starting to look very similar. Hey, optimization, system asset management, where essentially a lot of the unique features will start becoming shared as people are sharing what's going on in the industry. And the way that these manufacturers will then look to differentiate themselves will, will probably not be well, how many features they have, but how flex or how simple to implement these systems are. I wanted to pause to see if there's any questions. A great audience they're learning here. And, and uh, again, any, any comment or interaction, please let me know. Talk a little bit about utility and industry resources in our space. Teamwork makes the dream work. 
why do utilities care about connected lighting? Well, first and foremost, it ensures that, hey, you're saving energy. You're reducing the load that the utility is needs to, uh, to generate. So that's great. You need to generate less power for your customers, save energy. That's just the main and traditional value that uh, connect lighting can have for utilities. However, they, utilities want to be relevant in the space where their buildings and residential customers are implementing technologies. So utilities will, will take great go to banks to have these uh, releases, be it learning tools, be it uh, call centers, that will help customers implement these emerging technologies, be it technical assistance or customer assistance. Ultimately, utilities want to be a gateway to connected technologies. It maintains that relevance of utilities as, as uh, market catalyzers for, for these technologies to again, help them save energy, make them be relevant and help to set up for that grid, uh, smart grid edge connectivity. What benefits do you gain by connecting with the, your, your utility? Uh, again, you can ensure that utilities wanna invest in, in innovation and in energy efficiently. They can be your, your technical or customer support on projects, or you can access resources utilities may have on these technologies. Um, you can have access to, the, again, an encyclopedia of implementation knowledge because utilities review many projects being implemented and they have learned a few things from how these, are, these occur. And some utilities can point you to resources that will help implement the project as well. You can access impactful programming. A lot of utilities will have classes such as ours today, uh, where they recognize the importance of education and awareness of these technologies and how you can help implement these. And every organization that is in efficiency or connected lighting, we recommend having what we call a utility whisper. Someone that is plugging into that utility program, understanding how, what the requirements are pre-installation, post-installation, and being able to help navigate the conversation with the utility. Uh, these days, uh, program program design is is evolving, where a lot of the savings are not necessarily those performance only savings, but they are deemed or fixed savings. Where hey, if you implement this technology, you get this amount of money. It's not necessarily just waiting to see how much energy has been saved to award uh, an amount of money. Uh, and we can write, and, and the utilities in the Pacific Northwest, Seattle City Light included, are right-sizing the incentive. For example, they're offering a $50 per fixture on luminar level lighting controls, or sometimes network lighting controls that have uh, the similar characteristics as, as the smart fixtures. So again, as the incentives are getting right-sized, uh, utilities are, are really doubling down on, on looking to catalyze the implementation of these technologies and network lighting controls and luminaire level lighting controls. I wanted to point you guys out to another resource uh, from Pacific Northwest National Labs and the, and the Department of Energy called the Integrated Lighting Campaign. Uh, they are basically a col uh, this campaign is a collection of of network light control systems that are already interop interoperating with the smart building ecosystem. They want to collect a lot of projects that are that have smart building applications in order to share lessons learned or how to maximize the sa maximize the savings gained. Uh, the people the groups in this campaign are divided into two participants and supporters. The participants are those that have these projects implemented in their space and they are willing and well thankfully willing to share data as to how they implemented it and how they're saving money and how they are optimizing uh, lighting hvac and building management systems uh, and supporters are like lighting design lab and seattle city light are utilities manufacturers or energy efficiency organizations that provide some education and awareness to these technologies And Design Lab has, has our own set of verses as well. If you go said you can find a lumin, luminaire level lighting control video that talks about different benefits, applications, and studies uh, for this technology. 
we also developed what we call best practice guide series for network lighting controls. Ever, everything from, hey, what are the terms of the efficiency we wanna learn to what's coming in the future. Uh, and we recently developed lighting guides for verticals uh, on schools, K through 12, warehouses, and healthcare spaces. Again, you can find them all on our website or click the link here on our handout. We also do project specific consults where if you want to reach out to us and you're looking at a project, be it a residential, exterior, commercial, you can ask us questions and we can, we can work with you to ensure that your project is delivered in the best way possible. And also, hey, our classes, I don't have a slide for that, but always plug into our classes. We have interesting topics coming along. If you can help and it can help speed any conversation for projects, the better. Any questions thus far? We'll keep moving forward. How can we simplify the message and grab stakeholders' attention? A lot of this starts with what we call the lighting audit, our first session. A lighting audit is a way to benchmark how much energy you're using in your space through, uh, it takes all the fixtures in the building, all the controls, and, and you can understand again, what is your benchmark energy usage? But not only that, you can do many things with a lighting audit. You can make calculations to verify different solutions. You can see, hey, all of my existing fixtures are fluorescent, uh, incandescent, metal halide. And you can, you, if you learn it's a correct audit tool, be it an Excel file or a software tool, you can play around with different solutions to understand, hey, if I go a retrofit kit versus a new fixture versus LLC, what are the potential savings that we can make? It tells a story from an audit to a proposal. So it is great to leverage uh, lighting audits when it comes to, to information and lighting projects. Uh, a key communication and collaboration tool for lighting systems is what we call a sequence of operations. It communicates the design intent for a space. There are multiple ways you, you can develop a sequence of operations. Uh, starting by a simple narrative, you can use a, a simple matrix to say for each space type, what control strategy are we gonna be implementing? Uh, sometimes you can have a more complex matrix that will have actual values as to how a system design is, is made. And sometimes you'll have sequences of, of operations that will match to the construction drawings and, and say, hey, for this typical office, zones A through D are gonna be doing this. So we're gonna have daylighting in these zones. We're gonna have uh, scene control in these zones. So again, sequence of operations is a key document to communicate how you're gonna design the space. And that can go through a scope gray area because there's not one specific person that is dedicated to make a sequence of operations. So it is going to be key to, to get by on who is making this document and how many stakeholders can, can leverage the document to understand, hey, here is the intent for your building. Does this make sense? What room is going to have luminar level lighting controls? You know, what, and, and again, just key way to communicate with your stakeholders what you're looking to do in their space. Uh, another trend that has been ongoing in lighting is, is commissioning and wall stations, what we call the user interface to the systems. Tenants leverage wall stations to operate the systems. Uh, facility professionals are going to leverage the commissioning tool to, to program the system. And it's been and it's been in a growing trend where in the past, sure, it was a lot like Morse code, a lot of uh, button presses, the pair of devices, and a lot of button tilt presses as well to, to specify timers and sensitivity for sensors. Now it's all going digital, not, not all, but the majority of these systems that are mid-scale, wireless, uh, scalable systems are leveraging phone and app-based uh, commissioning tools or computer-based commissioning tools to get programmed. 
when it comes to wall stations, another scope gray area uh, when it comes to engraving or when it comes to how many buttons each face is going to have. If you have a solid lighting designer, they usually take care of this. But uh, again, it could be another scope gray area where people don't uh, understand how they're going to implement their wall stations. You see a lot of projects that are unengraved uh, and you need to navigate what we call this simple to complex spectrum of wall stations. You know, you don't want to have, give a tenant uh, a eight button wall station that does not have any engraving. It's going to confuse them. They're not going to interface with it. We at LDL conducted a survey on wall stations and we, we saw the results where users prefer multi-scene specific text labeling. So that meaning is rather than having three on off or three dimmers in a wall, users prefer to have one wall station that has multiple buttons that has purposeful text labeling with dedicated raise and lowers. It is the most preferred way to, for tenants to control the space after an 80, 82 person survey that we have conducted at the end of last year. Uh, for facility professionals, Key, key to leverage and permanent system is that configuration tool. Uh, we found that configuration tools are more accepted by facility professionals when they have an ordinal process, meaning there's a, a logical flow that the app helps drive you through it, uh, where there's visual confirmations of the settings that these commissioning tools uh, set, be it on the fixture itself or on the app itself and that there are integral help features. There could be videos, snippets, or, 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 or tool tips as to how to commission different things, as well as very solid error messages if there's anything uh, with an issue on programming a setting. A great amount of apps are still very confusing, and, and not every system uses an app. So again, as we go forward implementing network lighting controls, the many factors that are really going to stand out are those that are going to simplify the commissioning uh, process. You can, and that goes for both, you know, digital app-based configuration tools or remote-based or other. Quick question on, hey, does it take more time for an NLC zone-based system to set up or a luminary level lighting control system? What takes the most amount of time? Uh, well, LLC has integral load controller, occupancy vacancy sensor, and daylight sensors. With a zone-based NLC system, these three objects will be separate and be distant from each other. So how to find them, pair them, configure them, and group them is gonna take a little longer for a zone-based NLC system because LLC has one device to discover instead of three separate ones, one device to add to a room. Uh, however, in the LLC world, if you need to program this in a granular fashion, if each fixture needs to do something different, that is going to take a bit more time than a zone-based NLC system. So if you need more complex programming, NLC systems will be probably quicker to commission. If the programming needs to be simpler, does not need to have that much detail, LLC system will probably be faster to commission. Um, a great note is also to leverage your implementers, leverage their procedural efficiency. We know when, when we talk about manufacturers, they have your global industry knowledge and about the latest and greatest emerging technologies and can serve as solid technical advisors for projects. However, your territory reps, the people that are in your area, they'll have the regional operational knowledge, know who are, are the better contractors to help with the installations. They'll know how different customers will prefer their systems to be delivered. They can help with that local coordination and be part of that project. But a lot of these manufacturers will have, you know, their own flavor of codes, product development uh, softwares and tools. Uh, some manufacturers provide one lines with the packaging. Uh, some manufacturers will even prepare or pre-commission components. So it's be important to note uh, having these relationships and knowing who can go the extra mile preparing for your project will, will take you a great way in 
and, and ensuring that the project is delivered successfully and, and simple and even, again, prepared and pre-commissioned, which saves a lot of time of, and labor in the field. Are just examples of, of a quoting tool that Lutron Electronics uses, as well as a project development software that's pretty nifty uh, to pair, you need to understand what components are going to go where in a system. So again, important to leverage your manufacturers or your implementers' procedural efficiencies. Uh, this ha happens a lot with electrical contractors and no other building contractors where other building contractors usually look to upsell systems, uh, devices, labor. Electrical contractors are known to sometimes typically downsell or value engineer where you remove hardware or features at the last minute to reduce cost. But what really is being removed is the value that we deliver to the tenants, to the customer owned facility professional. Um, the real value engineering should add to the upfront cost, reduce uh, the life cycle cost. So the more, the better you invest upfront, the more savings you can realize because the building's not going anywhere, the system may not go anywhere. So if you have the correct features installed at the go, you, you'll see the savings as the years go by. You don't necessarily want to devoid your system of good features that is going to increase your maintenance costs in the long run. Seeing if we have any questions before I go on to talk a little bit about financials. I say nay, so we'll carry on. So a little bit of financial conversations, a great measure of uh, of a system life is a simple payback where simple payback basically gives you how many years is it going to take for the system to pay for itself and then it's a formula of, hey what's the cost of materials plus labor and services minus any rebates we can get from utilities and when you get the true cost of the project you then divide it by energy and maintenance savings per year and that's going to be, again, your simple payback number. Uh, it is a quick figure to get to, but it does not paint the full story. What really paints the full story is what we call a life cycle cost analysis. Where sure, the simple payback can, can be here in the initial cost when you're looking at what it all takes to implement for the first get-go. Uh, then when you're done developing, you know, you want to tell the story how much it's going to be for installation and programming. Uh, then as the years go by, you want to see how to include non-energy benefits as well as your savings and, and operational cost in your life cycle. The more you can quantify NEB is the better. It is very difficult, but a strategy of how to quantify network non-energy benefits, it's, it's going to be, uh, hey, what would it cost for me to grab a space utilization system versus just turning on the spatial utilization feature on my network lighting control system. And, and the difference between those costs can be a good way to quantify it. Uh, nice tidbit, the Design Lights Consortium is now looking for consultants to help quantify the value of non-energy benefits. So expect in a, in a couple of years to have hopefully a smoking gun as to how the industry is going to quantify these and deliver value to owners as to how to, to help in their decision of investment. Uh, and, and lastly, the life cycle cost nudge is also going to include the disposal costs for any system or when a system is nearing end of life. So a simplified 10-year example where, for example, you have a lighting system with all the hardware and labor is going to cost you, you know, your $65,000 hey, your rebate incentives are going to be factored into the, to the equation. So the actual expenditure or investment for the system is your $50,000. Then what do you want to measure like in a very simplified example? And so, hey, what are your maintenance and energy savings that this system is going to help get? Uh, what's really important for stakeholders is to speak in the financial metric terms that they prefer. 
some will prefer a simple payback is going to be nice enough knowing that hey this system will pay for itself uh in between three and four years uh some will want to see what's the net present value of of, of a system and, and i'm going to go into the calculation today but uh other my other stakeholders will prefer to see what's your return on investment and and understand what that means for for this be the building's financials but again ultimately you're looking to get a life cycle 10 plus year analysis so you can tell a story and expectations to those building owners to make the right decision uh we talked about this the entire time, but we got to get the right message to the right people. And proposals are, are that quintessential message uh, to the ultimate decision maker. Key components for, for a great proposal include, you know, a title with a subtitle that has both quantifiable and, and measurable goals. Tell us what are your qualitative goals? Um, what's the target for the project? You need to have a problem statement you need to be able to deliver some of those numbers and, and ideally in the financial metrics preferred by the stakeholder. Uh, understand what's the current state of the system without your proposed project and also drive an action. Here's a quick example of a one page proposal calls out 20% more light with 40% lower energy costs for the parking garage at 123 Project Street. So again, more light, 40% lower cost, so both qualitative, quantitative measures. And then subtitle reads, improving security, saving energy, lowering operating costs, and boosting your energy star score. So again, great qualitative targets that you're going to be reaching with this project. Again, and, and it boils down to, hey, improving this parking area lighting with the fit energy efficient LED technology. Uh, again, just language to let you know very directly what are we looking to achieve with this project. And get your bullet points as to each how to, each problem statement is going to be improved with this project. Ultimately, hey, financial considerations is going to be estimated at 50k after utility incentive of this much. A 10-year analysis yields or net present value of this. So there is a whole story being told with both uh, qual quantitative measured and qualita qualitative measures, financial metrics, and the target for the project. When it comes to finances, a lot of people balk at upfront costs because these systems, now that they are network lighting control systems are more expensive than, than legacy lighting controls. Uh, especially because they offer such great new benefits. Um, but for, for people, stakeholders, and groups that do not, that do not want to consider the higher upfront cost of network lighting controls, there are different models or financing approaches that you can take to allow for these systems to be implemented. One, one popular one is called lighting as a service uh, or energy efficiency as a service where there's going to where your implementer basically takes care of all the upfront costs for you know hardware commissioning and even maintenance is going to be uh covered by that implementer uh and after all is installed the building will realize savings obviously from the from the electric bill so from those savings is how you're going to be paying that implementer on a subscription type basis from the savings that you generate after the systems have been installed that's how you that's that's the money that you use to pay their implementer and not the entire savings you can keep some of the savings for for the building itself in some models but usually alongside this model the implementer will also provide their own energy meaning infrastructure that's how they'll see how many how much savings are really going to be taking place and compare to hey if they did not install a system what would what were the history of the energy usage uh what is that history of the energy usage to understand the forecast of you were at this level last year now with a new system you're at this level and this difference is going to be savings and you can pay the implementer with with that difference 
Uh, Seattle City Light has their own energy efficiency as a service pilot where they're having, again, they'll be paying for a system to be implemented. And a little bit of how I explained it, where, hey, before a retrofit, this is your energy bill. Uh, after a system, a network lighting control system has been implemented, and not just lighting control, I, City Lights Energy Efficiency Pilot may, may expand to other systems, but uh, after a system's been implemented, these realized savings are gonna be used to pay for the system cost. And the customer, the way that Seattle City Light implements is the customer will remain bill neutral. They'll still pay as if their system was not there until they finish paying for the system. Then they have both the new system and the savings that drive from it. Uh, the Department of Energy has a commercial building tax deduction called 179D, where they can pay up to a a dollar eighty per square foot if you implement a lighting system that goes beyond the ASHRAE 90.1 code. So also a good tidbit to know. So I want to talk a little bit about the cost of waiting. What happens when a customer does not want to pull the trigger on a project? Uh, there is urgency behind network lighting control projects. It is very possible that utilities run out of funding if, if a project is not done in a certain time period. Uh, customers and owners continue overspending on energy uh, because they've done, they, don't, they have not implemented ways to save uh, time or power. Uh, you continue overspending on human capital. That's because your facility professionals may not have dashboarding or diagnostic capabilities that will help them find any fixtures that are, that are having issues and, and they're again we'll need to be finding that needle in the haystack in the building uh, of a fixture that needs fixing and legacy lighting control or lighting equipment may be nearing the end of life and start failing at faster rates uh, so important to listen to the stakeholder objections but to let them know there is an urgency in implementing these projects Lastly, I wanted to make you guys aware of a resource, the Trade Ally Network Northwest here uh, working with us. They have what they call their field guide. Every year they develop a field guide that has uh, great tips and for both lighting and HVAC implementation projects. And one of my favorite sections of the field guide is uh, if they say, you say. They have a page where like, hey, they can talk about customers that may not have a budget for an upgrade and then list the different the different uh answers and different concepts of the how even if you don't have a budget how it's still important and possible to drive the project home and uh oh i just want a cheapest option and again tidbits tips and tricks as to how to counter suggestions from those customers Pausing and final questions. I think we are reaching the end of our presentation here a few minutes early, so I'm going to give you back a little bit of time. Uh, thank you, audience. Thank you for participating in the polls. Uh, I saw that there was no questions or comments, but I thank you for being here with us. I am going to now give you back to Katie to close us out. Thank you, Armando, and we'll just do some uh, end of class. Uh, information and the questions are still open so go ahead and type if you have any um, that you thought of now that we're at the end of the session um, but coming up we've got uh, network lighting controls specific um, uh, courses including for warehouses and, and for healthcare in April and at the end of April um, Armando's leading a discussion on the winners of the lighting and homes for tomorrow 2020 competition um, it's a little bit shorter uh, presentation but that should be should be fun uh, and again um, in, give give me a few days uh, to get the uh, video and handout up on our website but they will be here by be there i should say by next week um, armando's contact information is 
right there. You can jot it down if you don't want to wait until this gets put up on the website. And actually, we just um, created a new um, page on our site for um, the handouts, and I posted it into the chat. I think it, I hope it showed up. Um, uh, off our education page instead of off the resources page. Now it's a little bit cleaner and easier to find once you get to the page. Um, and again, our email address, lightingdesignlab at seattle.gov. We are Seattle City Light employees. That is all. Uh, once we uh, exit this webinar, a uh, survey should pop up. I think it's, you know, eight questions maybe. It's real fast. Um, Appreciate it if you give us some feedback. Thanks a lot, everybody.